who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head. For she is one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, let her also have her hair cut off. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to have his head covered since he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of man. For man does not originate for, from woman, but woman from man. For indeed, man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. Therefore, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. So, you, you can see the symbolism and imagery here. A woman must have a sign of authority on her head. The, a, a woman wearing her, her headscarf following this passage should be doing so to show that she is subordinate. Somebody is above her. Uh, the man is above her, and of course above the man is Christ. So there's a hierarchy of beings, and the woman is actually way down below. You have God and Christ and man and then woman. So it's a different sort of imagery here. If one says that the Quran demeans women and the Bible praises uh, women or puts them in a much better light, uh, I think one has to think again because the reality is actually the opposite if one were to really be familiar with most scriptures. Of course, we're not so familiar with these scriptures because who bothers anymore? Most of us have the better sense to realize that Paul here is writing at a time when he could think in this way. And we don't think in that way anymore. Again, we think that's the Bible, that's what it said at one time. But God has given us intelligence to think, to reason, and uh, we are informed both by the reason and the scripture. Now, it turns out that uh, according to the Bible, a man could sell his daughter as a slave. Exodus chapter 21, verse number 7 says, If a man sells his daughter as a female slave, she is not to go free as the male slaves do. I don't have time to elaborate on that, but I think that's enough. Now, there is a way that uh, a man might be required to prove that his daughter was a virgin at the time when she got married. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses number 15 and forward. Recently, we got all hyped up about the Aksa Parve's uh, murder, and we're wondering, what does that have to do with Islam? And some people are thinking, well, yeah, that's Islam's teaching. You know, honor killings all over the Muslim world. What are Muslims doing? They're following the Quran. They're not following the Quran. The Quran, in fact, prohibits Muslims from taking innocent life. And uh, taking a life for what people call honor killing is actually a dishonorable murder, for as far as uh, I can understand from the Quran. But we can see that uh, in the Bible, there is some hint of... Uh, something that we might call honor killing. Just listen. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses number 15 forward. Then the girl's father and her mother shall take and bring out the evidence of the girl's virginity to the elders of the city at the gate. I should preface that by saying that's in case her husband says, when I married her, she wasn't a virgin. The girl's father shall say to the elders, so apparently the father saves uh, some of her garments from the wedding night, uh, perhaps stained with uh, uh, material that will show that she was a virgin at the time. So now he parades it before the elders of the city to prove that his daughter was a virgin. The girl's father shall say to the elders, I gave my daughter to this man for a wife, but he turned against her. And behold, he has charged her with shameful deeds, saying, I did not find your daughter a virgin, but this is the evidence of my daughter's virginity. Imagine how shameful that must be for the girl. And they said, they shall spread the garment before the elders of the city. So the elders of that city shall take the man and chastise him, and they shall fine him a hundred shekels of silver and give it to the girl's father, because he publicly defamed the virgin of Israel, and she shall remain his wife. He cannot divorce her all his, all his days. But if this charge is true, that the girl was not found a virgin, then they shall bring out the girl to the doorway of her father's house, and the men of her city shall stone her to death. Because she has committed an act of folly in Israel by playing the harlot in her father's house. Thus, you shall purge the evil from among you. You see, why she brought to her father's house to receive her death penalty? Because this is how you purge the evil. Because she has defiled her father's house. And now the name of the family must be cleared. And the same thing goes, uh, or sub slightly differently, for a priest's daughter. Leviticus chapter 21, verse number 9. Suppose a priest's daughter makes herself unclean by becoming a prostitute. Then she brings shame on her father. She must be burned to death. Why? You see what's happening? She brings shame to her father. You can understand that around the Mediterranean basin in ancient times, this was a very common way of viewing things. You bring shame to me, I uh, eradicate myself from that, uh, I eradicate that shame by putting an end to it in a very decisive way. A poor girl is, uh, is killed. Jephthah. 
Jephthah. I don't know how many of you know, know Jephthah. We didn't learn much about him in Sunday school. Uh, in Judges chapter 11, uh, then the Lord's Spirit took control of Jephthah, and Jephthah went through Gilead and Manasseh, raising an army. Finally, he arrived at Mizpah in Gilead, where he promised the Lord, If you let me defeat the Ammonites and come home safely, I will sacrifice to you whatever comes, or whoever, rather, whoever comes out to meet me first. Then eventually he gets home because he's destroyed all of these armies by the help of God. And when Jephthah returned to his home, this is verse number 34 in Mitzpah, the first one to meet him was his daughter. She was playing a tambourine and dancing to celebrate his victory, and she was his only child. Oh, Jephthah cried. Then he tore his clothes in sorrow and said to his daughter, I made a sacred promise to the Lord, and I must keep it. Your coming out to meet me has broken my heart. Father, she said, you made a sacred promise to the Lord, and he let you defeat the Ammonites. Now you must do what you promised, even if it means I must die. But first, let me spend two months wandering in the hill country with my friends. We'll cry together, because I can never get married and have children. Yes, you may have two months, Jephthah said. She and some other girls left, and for two months they wandered in the hill country crying because she could never get married and have children. Then she went back to her father. He did what he had promised, and she never got married. What a nice way of saying it. And she never got married. Of course she never got married. That's why every year, uh, Israelite girls walk around for four days weeping for Jephthah's daughter. So, we can see then that in, in short, there is something about honor killings actually in, in the Bible. Clearer than this is Deuteronomy chapter 13, which speaks about an apostate in your own house. If one of your family commits apostasy, what are you to do? You are to be the first ones to stone the apostate in your own family. So honor killings is very old. It predates the religion of Islam. It's not condoned by the Quran. But uh, we can see that in fact, uh, I don't know what they called it back then, but it looks like the kinds of things I'm looking at in the Bible right now uh, is similar to what we are referring to as honor killings in our present time. So you see, a lot of times people uh, misunderstand, they blame the Quran for something that it does not represent, and Muslims, of course, might be better followers of the Bible than they are of the, uh, of the Quran. But, you know, I, I don't want to commit any excesses here. I only prepared this to, to meet uh, Dave on his own ground, because I've read his books and I've seen the kinds of approaches that he takes. What is the punishment for rape? It is clear from the Quran that uh, uh, hiraba or highway robbery or attacking a person is punishable, but rape is not specifically mentioned in the Quran, either, either way, it's just not uh, mentioned. And one might see that uh, as, as a defect. One might say, okay, well, why doesn't it mention rape? It is a very common thing. I, I don't know why. This is the word of God, but Muslims uh, develop the Islamic law in, in ways that will try to enact justice. And, of course, we use our reason in addition to the scripture. Rape is wrong, we punish it. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses number 22 on forward, talks about what should happen in the case of rape. If a girl is attacked and uh, she is uh, not married, she is single, then uh, she, obviously she doesn't be belong to anyone. So the penalty is that uh, this, uh, the attacker is to pay her father uh, 50 shekels and take her to be his wife, and he's not allowed to divorce her for as long as he lives. So if one were to survey the result, it's uh, quite obvious that the girl gets raped, her father gets the money, the rapist gets the girl, and the girl gets to live with her rapist for the rest of her life. He had better watch out he doesn't get poisoned or something. Well, in short, I must uh, wrap this up by saying that the Quran and the Bible are two books with both, which both contain excellent teachings from God. I want to have them both. I want to read the Quran in the light of the Bible, the Bible in the light of the Quran. I want to benefit from all of the wisdom that is there between these books. I, I had not had a chance to, tonight to elaborate on what I find to be some of the most beautiful passages of the Bible, some moving, very interesting and motivating passages, passages which teach us about kindness, about love. Uh, some of these passages are very striking. Who can deny the truth of Jesus' uh, Sermon on the Mount, for example, about blessed are the poor, and so on? I, I love those passages. I'd like to have both books, the Bible and the Quran. But if one forces me to choose between the Bible and the Quran, I would say I would choose the Quran, and I have mentioned some of my reasons here tonight. The Quran, to me, guides us to that which is just and right, against violence, and towards equitable treatment towards women. Thank you.